Well, it's uh, indeed uh, my great pleasure to introduce someone to you uh, whom you already know and know quite well, in fact, a longtime president of the Ulysses S. Grant Association. And I might just note that he is only the second president in the history of the Grant Association, Ralph Newman, Chicago being the first. We all know that Frank Williams is from Rhode Island where he's long been a, a leader in the state's judiciary, uh, retiring more or less finally as Chief Justice of the Royal Island Supreme Court, but continuing to this day to do a mediation. Now, what can I tell you about this man that you don't already know? Let me just ask you one question. How many chief justices do you know who have people call them by their first name? Not very many. Well, here's a couple of things you might like to know about that you may not know about Frank Williams. He served for five years in the United States Army, both on the border in Europe and, uh, and during the Cold War, and also, of course, in Vietnam. I think many of you may know, or you're going to learn for the first time, that he's married to the wonderful Virginia Williams, a Texan, if ever there was one. <laughs> she taught kindergarten. She built stone walls around their property in Hope Valley. And by the way, she also built stone walls for some of their neighbors, too. I'm talking serious stone walls. Uh, the two of them rescued Dobermans who have been maltreated. Uh, when one passes away, Frank and Virginia bury that special canine in the Doberman Cemetery on their property, and then they go ahead and rescue another one. You may not know, too, that Frank was born into his family's landscape construction business. And he tells me, he tells me that he pitched in to that hard work. That's what he says. <laughs> but at the same time, it's also true that his mother was teaching him how to bake and how to cook. And today he is indeed a master chef. In fact, he's even been featured on the television station in, uh, in Rhode Island. You're going to hear more about this tomorrow, but it was in the sixth grade that he began collecting Lincoln material. And what he did is, he tells us, he used his lunch money, didn't eat lunch, used his lunch money to buy Lincoln purchases. I also very importantly want to tell you Another thing that you may or may not know about Frank Williams, that Frank Williams is now a real MSU Bulldog. <laughs> you know about, of course, his donation and Virginia's marvelous donation of their Lincoln collection, but uh, you may also have heard uh, on the screen how this collection, the Grant collection, has made MSU a center for the study of the Middle Period, the Civil War, Reconstruction, the Gilded Age. But you may not know that Frank Williams has never really been a sports fan. <laughs> uh, until recently. And he now rings an MSU cowbell and he watches the Bulldogs play on television whenever he can. In fact, I would submit to you that Frank is such a bulldog now that one of these days I expect to turn on the television and hear about Frank Williams issuing a court order, throwing into jail a referee or umpire who made a bad call against his bulldogs. Well, I could go on, but you all, you all want to hear what Frank has to say about his wonderful, wonderful collection. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you one of the nation's great Lincoln scholars, the president of the USGA, a true bulldog, and my friend, Chief Justice Frank J. Williams. 
Uh, John took away some of my thunder about how we got started collecting Lincoln. I was 11 years old, and I sat under a portrait and engraving of Lincoln, which is in the gallery, which had Lincoln's face. It was wonderful, a pine cone face that I really admired, but it was also it was also placed on the body of John Calhoun, which I didn't know until later. And Mrs. Taylor, my sixth grade teacher, and we do remember the great teachers, don't we, that, that uh, helped us along the way. She saw my interest in Lincoln and uh, really encouraged me, and that's when I began to spend my 25 cents a day on used Lincoln books. And then it just mushroomed. When I was 13, I wanted to be a lawyer because Lincoln was a lawyer, and I'm not sure what 13-year-olds really know anything about the future. Now that I'm 77, I'm not sure I still not know about the future as far as practicing law is concerned. And that's the story, really. And it was, it was very um, much in sync, that is the Lincoln and Civil War studies with uh, the practice of law and then when I became a judge on our Superior Court, our trial court. Virginia and I have been married for 52 years, so she came in to this Um, collection and was very supportive, especially being a Texan and a member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. <laughs> so uh, that's why her name appears on the uh, title of, of the gallery, because she was the Jim Crack person. She was the one who found three-dimensional objects to enhance the books and pamphlets, which was my first love. Now, um, then I'll get to the slides, but keep in mind, I started when I was 11. Virginia comes in 1966 uh, when we were married. And I've been collecting, or we've been collecting for over 60 years. Now, that's a lot of stuff. And, um, not to brag about it, but you'll only see a fraction of it tomorrow in the gallery because there are probably Ryan, who's been great, Ryan Sims from Mitchell. We they've counted twelve thousand three-dimensional items with the prints, the the uh, statuary, the political uh, paraphernalia, the legal materials, and sixteen thousand or seventeen thousand books and pamphlets. So it's huge. And I wish we had time to take you in the back room, John, when we have them tomorrow uh, for both the Grant and, and Lincoln uh, galleries. But that's where most of the materials, the research materials, the statuary, prints, paintings, and so on uh, can be found when people come to research. And I commend I commend, I, I don't know how much uh, more I can say about John, who's our executive director, and uh, Dean Coleman, and Stephen Canetto, and Ryan Sams, and the whole crew. Um, Matt Calder, who's running the projector, or helping me run it, in, behind the curtain. Uh, just wonderful people who've, uh, who've made this all come together in a relatively short time. So what I want to do, what I, what I want to do, and Virginia really wrote this paper, and I wanted her to give it, but she was shy and wouldn't do it. Uh, I want to give you a thought, a, an overview of collecting generally, and then get to uh, Lincoln A to Z on some items. Most of the items that, are, that you see here are in the collection. And uh, then, um, if we have time, take some questions. But there is tomorrow, which is the real treat when we um, when we go into the galleries, the Grant and Lincoln galleries. According to um, humorist uh, 
Paul Morales and collect has fallen into two distinct camps. Those who collect while traveling and those who collect the rest of the time. For the traveler, uh, collections are souvenirs or excuses to keep traveling. Uh, whether it's seashells and sea glass or postcards or charms, uh, they simply collect to remind themselves of the wonderful places they have been. Uh, those who collect uh, while at home, however, are more complex. Uh, what they collect tells the tale. Doll uh, and toy collectors are nostalgic. Uh, they yearn from simpler times and remember their own younger days with pleasant thoughts. Miniature collections. Uh, this is Virginia's small pig collection in the house. Like to be in command and in control of their environment. Two collectors. Or those who collect kitchen utensils are practical, always prepared types. They usually finish what they start. People who collect ink wells and um, or fountain pens or books like words that are fascinated and are fascinated by the world of grammar and syntax. Watch uh, or timepiece collectors are very precise and meticulous in their habits. Badge and metal uh, collectors uh, are generally patient, focused, and well organized. Those who collect uh, sporting items uh, tend to be action oriented and often enjoy outdoor pursuits. Basket collectors are usually artistic and appreciate the work that went into the making of the basket as well as its visual an artistic aspect. Beerstein collectors are usually friendly and outgoing and enjoy being with others. Those who collect gadgets are contemporary thinkers and are ready to leap into the future. A person who collects military items is interested in history uh, and is a usually a preservationist. They like to be connected to the past and often feel they were born in, in the wrong century. Those who collect silver are often perfectionists and like to be surrounded by grace and elegance. But whatever they collect, people with collections uh, tend to be disciplined, productive, creative, and able to manage stress well. Well, let's turn to Lincoln now. The Lincoln collectors are in a class by themselves they manifest all the attributes ascribed to other collectors and often exhibit several others not mentioned. With this in mind, Virginia and I would like to share with you some Lincoln items that are collectible. Uh, let's look at Lincoln collecting from A to Z. Now, the, the lesson here, which I would give to someone starting out to collect Lincoln, is choose one area, one or two or three areas. It's really become impossible to do what Virginia and I have done over the decades, and that is collect everything. Not only because of price, but because of availability and certainly storage. This uh, beginning slide is in the gallery, and it's uh, D.T. Weiss, in memory of Abraham Lincoln, Reward of the Just that was, uh, that was published uh, after his death. You might begin uh, your Lincoln collection with assassination items. Uh, there were many uh, views, lithographs of um, the shooting in Ford's Theater, and you would include Ford's Theater uh, and uh, this painting of Lincoln being born across the street from Ford's Theater to the Peterson House, born by uh, loving hands. And of course, the room in which Lincoln died was a very popular print. This one by McGee, it's also in the collection. And you can see uh, the Alonzo Chapel, the original is at Brown University, but there were many uh, colored prints of this, uh, this, uh, this print 
consist of 46 people in a room 11 feet by 17. And, and there are several. There are several like this, and we wonder how they could fit into that room. But they didn't. This is just... This is just a view of those who visited Lincoln the night he died, April 14, 1865, and when he passed at 7.22 a.m. on Saturday, April um, 15th. You might want to concentrate, and our friend Richard Gutman, who's been a member of our Lincoln Group of Boston who, and who wrote a book about John Wilkes Booth, is a specialist on conspirators, and the trial, which took place in what is now Fort Leslie J. McNair, they, it was an officer's club or officer's quarters. Uh, they've restored the, the room in which the trial was held, the military trial. Uh, you can visit there. And uh, the hanging in the same yard at Fort McNair of the conspirators, including uh, Mary Surratt. Also, uh, moving on to Avon bottles, <laughs> audio tapes, and there are many, hundreds, hundreds, uh, that are available. Badges, buttersea boxes, bells, no cowbells there, but bells, books, 16,000 books and pamphlets written about Abraham Lincoln, one about one every week, even now. And um, certainly the chapters and pamphlets uh, help uh, enhance uh, the, the, li the Lincoln Library. These, these are among our favorites. They're um, miniature books by a, a friend now deceased, Arch St. Ange from Worcester, Mass. He, he did a slew of uh, miniature books, just not on Lincoln, but on many, uh, many other topics. Certainly, uh, book, uh, book markers and book, uh, book plates. Bookends, there are many. Bottles, this is a common uh, bottle holding syrup, broadsides by um, by the thousands, the thousands, and even though they're paper, they're still available. This is an anti-Lincoln uh, broadside from 1864, and and his uh, re-election campaign as president. Buttons, this is celluloid, thousands of them. <laughs> Campaign memorabilia. You'll see this in the gallery tomorrow. This is a wide awake lantern, or at least the head of it. You can see the stem on the right. Uh, that's um, that's where the wick would be when you fill this with whale oil or kerosene, and the wide awakes would carry these over their shoulder with with rubber slicks to prevent the. Uh, the liquid from falling on them and they wear caps and there are some places that that claim the beginnings of wide awakes like Hartford, Connecticut but also in the Midwest. Campaign flags very rare because of the fabric and their likelihood to deteriorate. This one you'll see in the gallery the 1860 flag and photographs, uh, cots de visite, really, CDVs. Uh, they're about three by uh, five. Mary Lincoln, who loved to dress. This is a faucet photograph of the beardless Lincoln. <coughs> Cartoons, uh, the, um, the contemporary, not to us, and also to him. This was from a British newspaper, Punch. And of course, you get the uh, the annual. This this uh, this one is Lincoln with FDR, uh, Courier and Ives on the Republican platform, 
uh, against the extension of slavery. <laughs> Lincoln with uh, Woodrow Wilson. And we move into uh, into Christmas ornaments, which uh, proliferate, even starting with the White House Historical Society and their, their annual series that they have. Cookie cutters, cups and saucers, debate items from the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, including uh, reprints of Lincoln's copy of the debates, both his and uh, and Stephen Douglas, his political nemesis, that he had, he was so proud of them, even though he lost the election. Uh, he was, he had them uh, published by Follett Foster in Cincinnati, Ohio, and while rare, still available. Dishes. Dolls and doorstops. This is very popular, the emancipation items with the carpenter painting. This is the engraving, the original is hanging in the stairwell of the United States Senate. Huge, it's very, very large taking up a whole wall. And this um, Courier and Ives patriotic envelopes because you'll see in the left hand corner all kinds of icons and portraits of the war and politicians and, and others that uh, were famous during the war. And first day covers. <coughs> Folk art. And funeral items. Uh, Lincoln's procession on the 1200 mile railroad ride home, uh, generally following the same tracks and route that brought him to Washington in uh, 1861. The uh, funeral would stop in the leading cities of seven states, and his remains would be on view for the public. And we estimate that over three million people were, uh, were visiting or paying respects to the president. Those, the, the, dock, the dock center going into the front door of the Chicago City Hall may look like ants, but that's the procession of people that were going in to view his remains. And certainly, funeral medals and badges uh, proliferate. Glassware. Some of you know this. Pressed glass from Sandwich, Massachusetts, was made to commemorate Lincoln's funeral. You can see the tassel. There are those without the tassel as well. Very, uh, a very sought after object. And of course, Lincoln's manuscripts, very difficult to get. Uh, my first, our first, um, and Virginia was with me at the time, was a clipped signature of Lincoln. You'll see that tomorrow in the gallery. This came later. Lincoln is writing the appointments of George Thomas and James Shields as Brigadier Generals. Lincoln almost fought a duel with James Shields in the early 1850s. He was the Illinois controller. And um, fortunately, the second stepped in and the duel never took place. But it didn't matter, did it? Uh, even though Shields was a, was a political enemy of Lincoln, when it came time to prosecute the war, all of that was put aside, and as he did during his entire tenure as commander-in-chief, and appointed uh, people who were not aligned with him politically. 
including James Shields. This is an early telegraph from Lincoln, at least he's writing it out and giving it to the telegraph operator to send to a lawyer friend in St. Louis wanting intelligence of what's going on in those, uh, those cities and villages that he, he mentions uh, in that. Of course, images and icons, etchings, paintings. Uh, this is a, a maquette, a small version of the Guts and Borglum statue in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, the maquette is a smaller version in bronze. This is Lincoln with, uh, with a bench, not a bench, and in Newark, young children love to sit on that bench with, uh, with the president. Prince of Lincoln. This is an oil portrait uh, by uh, Wilson of Lincoln, which uh, was owned by the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells. Jewelry, plenty of that. Key rings. Lead figures, which are still made in, in different uh, sizes and, and different uh, colors. We, Virginia and I have collected them. And log cabins. Mugs. Medals by the thousands. This is a ferrotype with a portrait of Lincoln laid inside. Still, still available. And uh, needlework done by Virginia Williams. Oh. Nutcrackers. And odd items like uh, Lincoln's portrait on a leaf. That's a little closer. And this is old money that's been, that's been crushed together to make this little statuette of, of the president. Pennies still come out every year with the Denver, Philadelphia, and Washington Mint. And photographs like this one by Whipple you can see at the corner of the Lincoln home in Springfield, Illinois, this is the only home he ever owned. You can see the tall, lank, lanky Lincoln with his son, Tad. And a broken plate, uh, glass plate negative, that's how the original portraits in this period uh, were, were fastened to, uh, to the, the negative before uh, paper prints were made. Plaques. Uh, this is by uh, Brenner, Victor Brenner, and the, port and the profile is what was used for the Lincoln Penny in 1909 on the centennial. Postcards, again, this is the carpenter uh, painting of uh, the the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. Many from, many from 1909 still exist. These are, these are from that period. And these are um, quirky items. Virginia calls them stamp or rubber stamp. And soap, if you can just see on the left and the right with Lincoln splitting rails, but there's the imprint of Lincoln. And relatives, starting with Prince of the Lincoln family. This one is minus Willie Lincoln, who died of typhoid in February 
1862, you see his portrait in the upper right. This is a more uh, rustic Link, uh, Robert Lincoln to Lincoln's right uh, is now an assistant adjutant on the staff of General Ulysses Grant who did Lincoln a favor because of objections from Mary Lincoln to make him a member of his staff because she feared he would die just and she would be losing a third son. And this is Robert about the time he went to Harvard, University, Harvard uh, College and uh, then eventually into service with General Grant and then he became a lawyer like his father. And this is Tadpole, Thomas Lincoln, who became the apple of uh, his father's eye when, when his brother Willie passed. And this is Willie. So smart, just like his father, he could he could uh, compose poetry at the age of 11 and could figure out the timetables of m many of the major railroads. And Lincoln's uh, horse, uh, Bob, old Bob, that was dressed for his return to Springfield, Illinois. Rogers groups. Uh, these are still available, although many were destroyed because they fell out of fashion after Victorian America. But this is one of the most famous with Lincoln and uh, Stan Secretary of War Stanton on the right and General Grant on the left. Uh, this portrait or this face of Lincoln, it was considered the best likeness by Lincoln's son, Robert. Sheet music, this is in reverse, so don't try to strain your eyes to, uh, but hundreds, hundreds of, uh, both during Lincoln's presidency and uh, after his funeral, uh, were manufactured or produced. Spoons, stamps, this is 1873 six cent stamp. They continue to be produced, not only in America, but across the seas, there are many countries that honor his memory. T-shirts. This is, this is um, tote bags. Unique items like, you'll see like this miniature, oil on ivory that's, that was uh, painted by Patterson in the early 1930s, which was just about the end of the era when miniature paintings or portraits, which had been very popular for hundreds of years, uh, died out during the Depression. This is in the gallery, uh, they, that portrait. Uh, got a percher. A tin type by and with a photo of, of by Cole in there, and Staffordshire. Uh, this is a set with Lincoln on one horse and the Duke of Wellington on the other. Uh, neither look like they're the people they're portraying. As you see, that that doesn't look like Lincoln, but that's the that's the Staffordshire uh, object. Volk items. You, you remember. You remember seeing this face. This is the Hermes bust by Volk. The bare chested. There's another one in which uh, the same head, but Lincoln, the, the lower torso, the upper torso has the garb of a Roman senator. And of course, the famous Lincoln hands that were molded from Lincoln in, in uh, Volk studio in, in Chicago in 1860. And you see the right hand with a dowel so he could clench his fist. And that's Lincoln, that's after Lincoln took a broom handle, cut it, and then used the, the piece so he could accommodate the sculptor. Volk's nephew, Douglas, made this portrait of Lincoln, which is in the uh, 
National um, Portrait Gallery. Videos. Most of these have been converted to DVDs now, but they're available by the hundreds, especially those great Lincoln films like, like uh, Spielberg's Lincoln and uh, John Ford's Young Mr. Lincoln and uh, starring Henry Fonda and uh, the um, Raymond Massey, uh, Young Lincoln in Illinois and others. Still available on DVD. Zany stuff. This is whiskey. Bourbon. That's supposed to be zany. Including this Lincoln as a bicyclist. And beer, Flatlander beer, drink good beer, it says on the label. Be kind, tell the truth, and Abe's Honest Ale. And that concludes the brief overview of the, uh, the whole object of, of collecting, and you'll see many of these objects tomorrow. So we have some, some time for questions. Now I know there are some collectors, some fellow collectors out there, so sound off. Yes? Did Abraham Lincoln collect anything? I, I think he liked those, the Cape May diamonds, but did he collect anything? No. And I think the reason for that was his poverty and early childhood where he, where he and the family had very little. And I think he felt fortunate to what we call the right to rise, that is, come from the laboring class to be a lawyer and politician, and then uh, the, the, the rest is history, as, as we say. Uh, so, but he really wasn't, he really wasn't um, enamored with material things. In fact, he wanted to make a decent living as a lawyer to support his family, uh, of course, Mary Lincoln could be very much of a collector, and was, uh, being a lady from Lexington, Kentucky. But I think, um, I think Lincoln had the, he didn't have the avarice to get, but when he did receive fees, he, he had the avarice to hang on to it, to keep it. Someone else. Yes. Mich yes, Michelle. Well, Michelle is asking about uh, being discreet with the collections and as we go along, but that's only been a recent phenomenon, you know, to be more discreet. <laughs> we were collecting everything right up until the time it came uh, in, two, in two semi trailer trucks to Mississippi State last June. And we're still collecting. And it'll all come here, all wind up here, pr uh, probably a shipment every year or two. Uh, but we get every book that comes out that's published on Lincoln, plus uh, articles, editorials, cartoons. All will come here. Uh, speaking of cartoons, there are thousands that were sent down here from, from uh, his time in Washington right up until uh, the present. So, but, but I, I, take, I take what you ask seriously, Michelle, because there are a couple of things that um, we love to have that have eluded us. One is a Marquette by Keck, which is a seated Lincoln. That's the small, and a couple of um, very difficult to find paper uh, caricatures of Lincoln during the war that, uh, that are in the Fort Wayne, uh, the, Fort, uh, the uh, Allen County Public Library, that, which they acquired from 
the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company. But those are those are limited that, that where we would like to get. But on the general level, we'll take anything, and it will come here. Someone else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, what uh, there's some um, that we really had as favorites and uh, we were glad to acquire, and the answer to that is yes, they were like children to us, but they're here. One is a presentation copy signed by Lincoln to Mrs. Spencer of the Lincoln Douglas debates. That's one. The oil painting by Patterson that you saw, the miniature, that's another. Uh, we um, we had our own funeral when the trucks left Hope Valley to come here because when you've got you know sixteen thousand <laughs> Virginia Virginia what was it morning <laughs> but it was an easy decision to make and it was the right time. We just had run out of room and space. This was housed in about six locations. So it was, the, the moving people, US Art, and they do, they're from Randolph, Mass, and they do, um, they do work for museums like the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. They're just, just so professional. Uh, they, they came down, a crew came down about how many men, honey? Five men, and spent, they virtually lived with us two and a half weeks <laughs> to pack, to make wooden crates to, to house the statuary, to house the photographs and the prints. Many of them were not framed, of course. There we had four, four or five drawer units, architect's files, the biggest you could get to house the prints that we had that were not framed. And not one item, right Stephen, not one item was damaged on the trip down here, which is, which is really unheard of. So this was a big undertaking. Yes, Harry. We did. Yes. Yeah, Harriet's asking about our, our cataloging system. Most of the books and pamphlets were cataloged by David Rich, who's a rare book cataloger at Brown University. He became like a member of our family. He died a few years ago, and, the catalog, and we tried other catalogers. It did not work. So we had to keep most of the books and pamphlets that had been cataloged by David and we were still using the old library cards because we started before the, uh, the software that, that is now available. And we had Fred Calabretta from the Mystic Seaport moonlighting on three-dimensional items. That was, that was current when it came here uh, and, and on a flash drive so available so what Mitchell Memorial Library had to do was get the cards that we sent first and get them digitized. And now they've gone through them and they've added whatever it is they want to add to each of the books. Uh, they're now on the pamphlets. And they have, they have available uh, Fred Calabretta's catalog uh, online, which is for the um, uh, for the three-dimensional items. So there was a head start on that. Someone else, before we break. Well, you've been great, and I, I'm so glad you're here to see not only the Lincoln Collection, but the Grant Collection tomorrow morning, when John and I will, um, and Brian will be around uh, with Stephen, and we're gonna do, we're gonna do the tours and shifts Half of you will come with me for the Lincoln Gallery, and half will go with John for the Grant Gallery, and then we'll shift off. Thank you all very much. You've been great.